Hi everyone, welcome to the lost generation outside of the mainstream. My name is William Hooker. I am a musician, poet, and part of this generation of artists. My goal with this podcast, which is being broadcast on its own YouTube channel and my website, williamhooker.com, is to introduce you to many of the musical artists that are outside of the mainstream and have made important artistic contributions to our culture. I have also interviewed producers of the music and many fans and supporters of this work. My guests are sharing what makes this art form unique and significant. I hope these conversations will inspire you to listen to the music, which may change you and the way you view music, which again is outside of the mainstream. Today, I am interviewing Dick Griffin, trombonist, composer, and visual artist, as well as Warren Smith, drummer, composer, and band leader. For the rest of the summer, we will be having one interview per month. We will resume our regular schedule of two interviews beginning in September 2019. This is The Lost Generation outside of the mainstream. This is a story that needs to be told. Do you think, Dick, that the contributions that we have made are meant for a wider audience? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I think that uh, it's a disparity among music exposed to a different audience. I don't see why we should not even have it in the elementary schools. Because I, I've played so many times in elementary schools where we just did free improv. They love it. I mean, they, they, they latch in on, on to it. Kids, you know, they respond to it. It's just everybody tend to, um, how can I say it? They are taught everything. And once you expose somebody to something, they're taught, they they taste it, and then they they get a taste for it. But the the thing that, um, yes, the answer is yes, we should be be to a wider audience, and we should also be going to the schools with our structured uh, systems that we've learned by college and education and master's and doctorate, and we, we teach that system, but then we don't teach the other side of it. That's another another way of doing. It. I tell you a good example. And I'm going a little bit on. I went to uh, Michigan State and and and, and I do a workshop just recently. Mm-hmm. And uh, everybody there had more technique than I did. They could play faster, cleaner, play all the transcriptions, play like JJ, play like Curtis, and everything. But I asked each student, I said, I want you to play a love song, eight bars. Just play a song that I feel that you're expressing love. Then I want you to play a song that you just won the lottery, and I want you to express that uh, happiness. <laughs> then I want you to play a song that the most closest relative to you just passed away, and you're going to express that in eight bars. <laughs> Some kids were crying and had me crying. See, they don't teach that in school. Hmm. That's what's missing in the music today is coming from the heart and expressing. They don't talk about it, they can't teach it. You can't teach a person to express how they feel. And it's missing in the, in the music. And that's what the music was about. When I was there, I was there with Sun Ra and I was there. When the riots in, 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 in uh, 68, that's what uh, Extension and all those songs were about. 
and and all of that stuff. That was about. That's mm -hmm. when they were they they were screaming and hollering. They were telling a real story. They were expressing a lot of dissatisfaction about the way the political scene was going on, mm -hmm. and 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 they were expressing anger. You know, I remember being on a band with Archie Shep. You know, and uh, <laughs> this is kind of funny. Um, we were going to Philadelphia. Hammett Brewer was in the band. A lot of the guys in the band. And uh, uh, it, it, one of the musicians came on, and, and the Blue didn't like it, and he got off the bus. He said, "This musician ain't about what we're talking." And he was getting ready to get off, and and, and Archer had to express, you know, explain to this guy that he was cool. He knew what he knew the language and everything. But Blue said, mm -mm, "This ain't he, this man ain't gonna talk, tell the story I got to tell, and this ain't gonna work." So I remember that. So I'm mm -hmm. going on and on about all of that. Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. And 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 it should be continued. Thank you. Because I think that I think that speaking speaking for myself and I think that other people of my generation, mm -hmm. that's what we've been trying to do. We've been trying to widen some of the um some some of the hallmarks that you guys have actually laid down for us. Mm -hmm. That's important. That's important. And I say to Warren um, you didn't know this, Warren, but, but my mentor, a person that listened to me in the middle of the night, that used to watch me cry and talk about things that were going on in my own personal life, was Rashid Ali. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. In the middle of the night, we'd be talking. Mm -hmm. And I say that because... <clears throat> Um, what do you think are some of the contributions that my generation has made to what you actually experienced with the older cats? And I want I want to I want to say those that you, when you look in these faces right in this room, what contribution? What is that contribution that you think has been made? Because that's that's what I'm focusing on. See, I, I grew up in Chicago, first of all, and in the 30s and the 40s, all right? Mm -hmm. And it was really, really, really compartmentalized. You could use the word segregation, whatever you want mm -hmm. to use. Okay. Sure. Yeah. But we, were, we didn't think of it like that because we had everything in that neighborhood that I lived in. We had commercial places. We had shows. My father would get up and put on his tuxedo and go to work at night you know, in, in a show or, or a nightclub mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes we'd go and pick them up at nights. So this was a whole thing that we just, well, this is a way of life. Sure. Know? Now, we didn't know what was going on on the north side. It was completely alien, mm -hmm. you know. And there were some other definitions farther south out by the stockyards that was controlled by another political element. We didn't know anything about that stuff until we got out of Chicago and saw so a lot of these people from different areas coming to New York and then explaining ourselves to each other outside of Chicago. You know, but Chicago was a buster, man. I mean, they had everything that New York had except the recognition of being in New York. Mm -hmm. And I remember that going up very, very, very vividly. You know? But now that you look at, mm -hmm. now that you look at these spaces that are in this room, mm -hmm. now, Obviously, it took a it took a it took a minute for us to connect. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, right? yeah. And and it probably took a minute for you to connect with some of the people that I know look at you with mm -hmm. such such respect that are that are because I remember our conversation we had. You telling me I'm I'm such such an age, and I told you never say that to me again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said this, but 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 I didn't say that in a in a disrespectful way. I said that in a way so that I want you to realize that you're still a beacon for drummers like myself to realize what you've done, what you've played, who you played with, and that's the only reason I opened it up with this uh, with the Rashid Ali quote. Yeah, but. Um, do you feel that what we are doing and have done is also um, something that should be for a select few that are in our cultural dynamic? Because obviously, 
for some free players, we got a certain cultural dynamic. Mm -hmm. People, they, they, they're not, I don't know. And, I, you, and you've seen it, you've seen it. Let, let, let me tell you, more I, like, I, I, more I, like what many. I feel like is an all-court blitz from all directions of, of seeing all kinds of things. I mean, I teach, I perform, I go out and listen, you know, and it's a back and forth. Now, now when I came to New York, there was a standard that Chicago saxophonists had set up, you know, and we would listen to John Coltrane and some cats would laugh and say, you know, oh, he's practicing on the stage, or blah, blah, this and blah, blah, that. And then after a couple of years, then cats were imitating Coltrane, all okay. right? Now, the same thing happened, Vaughn Freeman came mm -hmm. before that, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking about saxophone players because my father, that was what I wanted to be, a saxophone player, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was the theatrical thing of drums with a light and the bass drum that attracted me to the drum set. But what I'm saying is all these influences were pushing me in another direction. You know, I knew I had to get out of Chicago because that was too tight. You know, I thought that New York was the answer, but it wasn't because New York <laughs> kicks everybody's ass. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But see, I was doing jazz, I was doing blues, I was doing Broadway shows, I was doing symphony concerts. I was, you couldn't get all that in Chicago because all of that wasn't there. You know, the, the, the whole theatrical thing, I would have missed that if I hadn't come to New York. But all these influences, at the same time, I'm listening to the cats pushing us. Um, I hate to call it classical jazz, but us standard jazz musicians from the swing era. Right, yeah. And I resisted that impetus until, you know, the, 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 the thing that I have now is that I fight myself every day to increase my tolerance of things that I don't know and don't understand. Beautiful. Beautifully said. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. I, I yeah, just get. Yeah. I get excited when I, when I hear no. somebody. I I get excited when I hear somebody saying that. Yeah. Because yeah. because I think you and you might you might agree you might disagree. Right now, right now, many of the people in their late sixties, seven late sixties specifically, we're still bucking up against that. Uh -huh, uh -huh, We're still uh -huh. really bucking up against that. You're playing with many of the people that you know they're bucking up against that inside themselves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The music mm -hmm. is still there. You know, the music mm -hmm. will always be there. But there's there's the, there's this there's this tension about not how free can I get, but what's wrong with you? Can't you hear this? Yeah. Thank you, Hill. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? Can't you hear this? This this is who I am. This is what I do. And and um, well, let, 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 yeah. let, let, let me interject something into that. If if I care too much what people think about what I do, then that might affect the direction of what I do. You understand? So what I try to do is connect with myself on the inside and let that come out, and then sit back and see how other people respond to it. Okay. You know, that might be a safe way of, of going along, you know, but I can't change what I've said or what I've done. You know, I mean, I throw that out and that's out there. Beautiful. Okay. Now, what's going to happen now? And I don't know the answer to that either. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, let me run a couple people by you and you tell me what you think about their music. We're not talking about we're not talking about personal, we're not talking about, you yeah. know, the attitudes, yeah. none of that. Mm -hmm. Just about the music. Tell me what you feel about the music specifically, mm -hmm. okay? Um Billy Bang. Oh man. Uh um, briefly, briefly. What he does with the violin is different. You know, now I've seen him conduct a whole string orchestra. You know, and it was mostly improvisation, and it was very typical. But when he picks up the instrument, it's like hearing the difference between uh, Coleman Hawkins and Ben Webster. You know what I mean? Because there's something that sets his approach off. There's, there's a certain energy that he puts into what he does that a lot of other violin players didn't do. You know, now there might be some refinements that some of them, Sanford Allen is far more accomplished 
virtuosic violinist, you know. Mm -hmm. But he would never think to do some of the things that Billy Bang did. And Billy Bang probably couldn't do some of the things that Sanford yeah, could yeah, do, yeah. but would never think to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm trying to <clears throat> combine all these things yeah. that I've mm -hmm. heard some really wild people do and see if I can incorporate them into what I see as discipline and break my discipline. And you mean wild in a good way? I, I mean wild in a very Beautiful. good way, in, a, in an inspirational way. Beautiful. Jason Wang. I'm going to throw Jason Wang at you, Dick. Okay. Uh, Jay Say, tell me something about his music, how you feel about his music. Well, I'm not familiar with his music as I should be, but uh, okay. let's go to Billy Bang because no, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me throw somebody else out. Yeah, okay, throw somebody else out. Right. Um, Cooper Moore. Oh, Cooper Moore, very unique. I love the way he play. Uh, Cooper Moore, to me, yes, is. Uh, just a, a jewel because he's one of a kind. I don't think anybody can approach the music like he can. He does, mm -hmm. makes the instruments, express himself the way he does. Yes, he is so unique, and so open and so creative. I, I mean, mm. I've had the experience of going. Uh, he come to my house and he played. You know, we talking about music. Um, he is one of a kind. I cannot say it, you know, like, uh, I, 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 Rasan, Roland Kirk, who I, I, I had the experience mm -hmm. of playing with, is one of a kind. There's no, there's nobody going to come along and do what he did the way he did it. Cooper Moore is the same thing. He has his own unique, unique way of expressing himself, making his instruments. He's very competent. Very well, you know. He mm -hmm. play play the piano like a piano player. Mm -hmm. He play the play yeah. the piano like like mm -hmm. somebody who doesn't even know what the piano is about, because he goes to another level of it. Beautiful. So, uh, like I say, he, he's one of a kind. And then, how many people should? Yeah, everybody should know about Cooper Moore. Masahiko Kono. Yeah. 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 You know Masahiko. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would yeah. you tell me something about his playing? Oh, no, 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 the, my, my, my goes Kono, I don't know much, much, much about him. You see, you're throwing the name at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, Dick, I'm with you. Yeah. No, I'm with you, I'm with you. Yeah, I have to talk about people that are really... Okay, then, I got you. Could I, 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 I add one thing about my Cooper Moore? Yeah, okay. Um, I worked with Cooper Moore with um, Bill Cole's ensemble. Sure. Uh, Untempered mm -hmm. Ensemble. Mm -hmm. And... His function in that particular band was to be like another drummer. He would take like an empty drum head with a brush and manipulate the pitch with his fingers while he was just playing, you know, and, and all of the kinds of percussion instruments. I didn't even realize at the time that he was a piano player. One day I was sitting in front of a television set in front of Boston, somebody put on a tape, mm -hmm. and I saw this cat literally tearing up his hands on the piano keys till he was leaving blood with the, the energy and, and the, you know, but not only that, what he was playing showed me a whole different Cooper Moore than this really secure, energetic force that I was accompanying and working with in this other ensemble. Uh -huh. And I said, damn, that opens up another whole... So I had to start listening to him in a different way. Because he showed me this other side that I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. and, and it was an open door to, you know... Mm -hmm. Rashid Bakar. How can I say... Um, that's another drummer, yeah. and, 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 and it's difficult. I got a lot of friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. he does, yeah. He does some car. things that that I probably would never think to do, and and yeah. then I'm always looking at other drummers and thinking I would have done that instead of what they do. Well, what can you say about the way he plays? Um, it's very lax very almost I would say conservative I, I don't see him physically I'm talking about physically conservative I'm not talking about okay the, the, I, the, the, the you. Ideas, you I, know I, I don't see him reaching out to extend himself physically to find something else that he's not doing right now 
you know. And other than that, I, I think I've always seen him as a, a very accomplished accompanist mm. to the people that he's worked with. I've never found any fault in the way he was working with Cecil Taylor, whoever mm. it may have been, you know. But I couldn't see myself doing exactly the same thing, but it's interesting and I learned something from it. Mm. Mm. I, have, I have the privilege of working with him, with Queen, Queen, Queen Taylor, and we, we did uh, uh, a festival uh, in Austria. What was that festival? Up on, up on the hill. Uh, Willis, huh? I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It, yeah, you know, Willis, huh? Well, yeah, Willis, uh, where you see the cows eating. Right, right. Yeah, they they look like they might fall. If they just tilt over, they might fall off the hill. But yeah, we, we had a nice thing. and. Uh, that's when I played with William. William, William was in the band. Rashid. That's right, yeah, William was in the band. But I'm talking about Rashid specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rashid. How, how, uh, how, how, is, how is that working? How, how are those four limbs working? Uh, you know, the, yeah, you know. And Cecil, you know how Cecil can go way up and way mm -hmm. down and everything, but he was always there. You know, mm -hmm. like, like he never was not. And in the right place at the right time. <laughs> That's all I can say is it's all about timing and drums deal with time and, and support and uh, mm -hmm. colors because he was very colorful when what he did but never mm -hmm. overshadowed, never stepped out, never got like oh the drum is too loud, the drum is playing too fast, or the drum is playing too slow or the beat is you know, the be playing behind the beat or, or the tempo drops. I hate that. The, mm -hmm. the worst thing in the world I've ever had happen is when the drummer let the tempo drop. <laughs> and you feel, oh boy, it's just like you're dying on the stage, you know. <laughs> but, but see, that, that yeah. there's a nuance to that too, because mm -hmm. in every section of the country, we hear the music differently. Right. In the yeah. Midwest, we don't hear the type of the beat yeah. right. like they do right. in New York. Right. You think you get farther west and they way, way, way back, back behind yeah, the beat, right. you know. Uh -huh. So it depends on where you come up from. from. I've right. always had to fight that thing about people thinking I'm slowing down because I didn't push. Right. You know, right. so I yeah. had to learn to do that like the New York drummers do that. Right. You know, so, so those nuances are almost... Uh, Topical or geographically, you're right. Hmm. You're right. I haven't you, thought you, about you, it like you, that. You, you can play. Yeah. You play right in top of, on, right, in, right on the beat. You can play in front of the beat, or you can play behind the beat. Yeah, like, exactly. And, and exactly. be consistent with it. Yeah. And then now in Chicago, you play a lot of blues, yeah. so you play way behind the beat sometimes. Right. right. You know? Yeah. A shuffle for the back. Yeah. It, the shuffle or whatever it is, yeah. but you listen to the singer singing. Oh, okay. You yeah. know, yeah. Yes. If they push it, then you push, but they usually crying and dragging behind, so everything's got to so, you know, like you got to be within the music. Yeah. Let me throw another one at you, Warren. Yeah. Kyle Perusha. Wow. Mm -hmm. that's now that's somebody I grew up with from that's the time. Wow. Yeah. Well, I was six you, maybe. You tell me about his music. Like tell that. me about Kyle Perusha. You know. You Man, know we grew up, up yeah. and, and... About his music. The, I, I, oh, okay. okay. I, I, I got to get to that. I got to define it. We, we were not... Um, okay. I was the only one who was interested in jazz with this little group of people. We, Melvin Van Peebles, Cal Prusha, and Melvin had a brother and I had my brother and there were other people, you know, mm -hmm. and we all listened. So they liked rock and roll. I didn't like rock and roll. I was into jazz. Yeah. They were liking all these other things I wasn't into. Mm -hmm. But when the music went out, when I came to, to New York, the music hadn't gone out as far as it had. When I came back, when my brother who introduced me, to these type of people, you know, mm -hmm. like Calipurusha. What do you mean by Cal these type of people? These these people like mm -hmm. Muhal, um, um, the AACM in general. Yes. All, all mm -hmm. these guys were thinking a different way, and I had been in the conservatory, you know, and mm -hmm. playing in orchestras and all that kind of stuff. So my thing was swing was as far as I had, you know. Now all of a sudden I get introduced to somebody like Elvin Jones or after him, Rashid. But even more importantly, I'm in my middle 30s and, and I go to hear Alan Dawson in Boston and instead he's got a little sub that's 14 years old. <laughs> and I'm years. saying, oh shit, I'm wasting my time. <laughs> and this little sub sent me to the woodshed for three years and his name was Tony, Tony Williams. I get it. And he was 12 years old mm -hmm. and he scared me so bad. In my middle, I thought mm -hmm. I knew how to play the drums, man. Wow. I said, no, nah, I got to go back home and, and study and practice. Do you remember this person 
that um that really I mean, open 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 up uh -huh. my head. Do you remember Rashid Sanan? Mm, yeah. That name sounds familiar, but He's I can't. He's Frank place. Lowe. He was playing oh. Frank Lowe. Black Beings. Yeah, 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 yeah. You remember this cat? Like, I, well, all right then. I, I'm just saying because you mm. see what what I what I'm trying to do. I'm seeing this whole. I, I know where the documentation has happened. I, I know out of William mm -hmm. Parker's books, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and also other books. But I'm saying that I'm saying that because there are some people that have actually changed the course of of um, the music, and they are unspoken. They're invisible, like um, Rashid Sanan, like yeah. Marvin Patillo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know you Marvin know, Patillo. I, I, I met him out. In the Kansas City recently. When Talk to me. Talk yeah. to me about that cat. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm trying to get back to Cal Perusha. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I get too late. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You know where I'm going. Oh! Yeah, but, cool. uh, <laughs> but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back. You know. Yes. But these cats were all into the rock and roll and the popular music and dance with the girls. When I went to Chicago, Cal Perusha had been to New York. When I went to New York, Cal Perusha had been here and come back. And he had started playing really outside. When he came back to New York, he and I got together in my studio and played every day for about six months. Maybe not on Sundays. Mm. But we would go in there and he was bringing me outside of boom, chick to boom, chick to boom, chick to boom, into a more expressive cause. He wasn't playing the saxophone very well when he came to New York. When he came back, I mean, he had studied saxophone with my father, who mm -hmm. taught some pretty good people like Johnny Griffin and Jane yeah. Adams, people yeah, like that. Right, right, yeah. But when uh -huh. he came back, he was into the saxophone then. Mm -hmm. And he had started studying, and all of a sudden his articulation and his technique had gotten cleaned up, and he wasn't just trying to honk and play the blues anymore. He was actually absorbing. And he made me do that with myself on the drums. You know, I mean, he gave me another kind of discipline towards, um, what should we call this music? Outside music, I Thank guess. you. you know, I'm going to ask Dick this. I'm going to ask Dick one more question. Mm -hmm. Dick, yeah. now, I mentioned, I mentioned Kyle Prusha because of one thing. I want, mm -hmm. I want you to elaborate on it, because you've probably been a witness to this. You've been a witness to this. To me, one thing that we've done is bring our spiritual, and I don't mean in a religious sense, our spiritual wherewithal and our spiritual strivings to much of this music. It didn't stop with ascension for me. Mm. It mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. It didn't start mm -hmm. with om for me. Mm -hmm. it, didn't st it didn't stop. It started. What what would and then I mentioned Kyle Perusha because if somebody comes up with an album and they're the same age as us and the album is humility in the light of the creator, mm -hmm. I'm saying, oh snap. This is what I this is how I feel. Mm -hmm. And now you've probably seen us trying to elaborate on that. Can you can you tell us about that contribution that we've made to this music that it came out of the black, the fake book. I had to memorize the fake book. I had to memorize the thing. Because I started early. Mm -hmm. But then when I started to find it as humility in the light of the creator, and that kind of a thing, it took on a whole other, whole other impact that many people, they, they can't relate to it for some reason. I don't know why, I don't have no reason, but they don't want to even acknowledge it. Can you explain what you saw Happen? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have to get back to Califorucci. Okay. Maurice, what's his name? Maurice McIntyre. Maurice McIntyre. Maurice 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 okay. I played with Maurice McIntyre in, in um, I guess, the 60s or 70s. Probably around the 60s, 70s. Yes. Uh, Reggie Willis, Blade mm -hmm. Days, Maurice McIntyre. Or Alvin Fielder. Right. 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 Okay. Um, okay. We all we played in Jackson, Mississippi, in an elementary school. That was the first and only time my mother ever heard me play. 
<laughs> wow. I mean, jazz, mm -hmm. you know, and concert bands and all that. First, and then it was our concert, and I was expecting, I didn't know what my mother would think, and she loved it, you know. Wow. wow. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was, you know, we were playing out, and my mother was there in the audience. That's the only time she's been to a concert. That, that, that's her mm. play live. I remember it was wow. at Mary C. Jones Elementary School. <laughs> and uh, Alvin Phil has the tape, he said he has the tape of it. But uh, yeah, but back then, my niece McIntyre. Who can play the instrument so smooth, so connecting, and uh, that concert rings out in my mind. Yes. And then, uh, yes, on and on and on. Yeah. I, 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 he like, uh, like a couple more, like a couple of other people. I mean, very unique in his his approach, and very sincere. This is one thing I noticed about when uh, people that, that really into the music, they're into the music. 10, 12 hours a day practicing. Mm -hmm. They don't even think about a day job, even though the rent might be due. They stay into the music. I remember going, uh, when I was in Chicago, and I'll give you, give you a little history on me, but when I was 19, that's when I met Sunrise. I used to go to Chicago for the summer. I was the first time I was into uh, integrated so-called, but it wasn't integrated, it was South Side, it was yeah, South Side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. 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 The first time he was out of the South. <laughs> right. I let me know I was out of the South, I mean, you know. So anyway, yeah. but. but <laughs> yeah, right. South Shore Country Club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, man, you know. And, but, it was talking about that, and like, these things are stand out with that, that, that uh, orange juice they used to have, the homes on the street, you know that? It was the orange juice that... The oh, 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 I know. Uh, 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 it, had, it had the pulp in the... It, it was such a good... I always... Uh, yeah. I think it was Holmes, I think. It was the name, name, name of Holmes. Anyway, I used to... I, <laughs> first thing I did was... Thank you, thank you, thank you. When I first came to anyway. Chicago, I would give me some orange juice, man, because the orange juice had pulp in it. And make that long story short, hey, that's when I met uh, 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 Sun Ra. I started okay. Sun Ra in 19... When I was 19 years old. Okay. And, and the story is, is brief, I have to tell it. Yes. My, my aunt, my aunt, aunt Camille, now I'm a little guy from Jackson and she was not going to let me get out there and get hurt in the city of Chicago so I had a curfew. So I could come out, I could go anywhere I wanted to as long as it was daylight in Chicago but it, 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 after the night I had to be there, be a, you know, yeah, and everything. So I, I fixed that after about a couple of weeks because I have an uncle, my uncle uh, Walter. When I started dating with Uncle Walter I could stay out a long, long, long. I'd go to by the bar at four o'clock, and when the bar closed, me and Uncle Walter would come home. But that was, you know, I would stay. So, so anyway, make that long story short. I was walking in in the street one day, and I heard live music. And I went, in, wow! And I met someone, and I said, uh, wow. He said, what well, you know, keep very open. I said, I play the trombone. He said, well, come bring your trombone and come rehearse with us tomorrow. And we rehearse every day. All day from about eleven o'clock to to if we had a gig that night, it was sometimes be in the Persian ballroom. That's where we were we rehearsing, where Oman Jamal did this Pontiana, but and then they had a Persian lounge. You know what I'm talking yeah, about, right? Yeah, the Persian yeah. ballroom and the Persian lounge. Mm -hmm. So in that Persian lounge, that's where I, we would rehearse and then mm -hmm. play it with someone. Mm -hmm. This guy knows. And across the street was a CNC lounge, and down the street was the right. Keys Fitzgerald lounge. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. on the corner was the Wall Street, I mean, that, that uh, drugstore. That, uh, oh, oh, uh, the, the, oh. yeah, I know. Walgreen. Walgreen, Walgreen Drugstore. Yes, yes, yes. Six and Third Street in Cottage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dorchester, down the street, mm -hmm. and then the John Young had this uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the. Right, with the trio. The trio. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, I can yeah. see that in yeah. my head right well, now. I want, I want to interject something. I want yeah. to interject something. Mm -hmm. Studio Wiss was very, very important for my generation. Studio Wiss was very, very important for the evolution of what I feel is, for lack of other terms, free jazz. Um, I can remember a person, I want you to elaborate on Warren specifically because it's a person of my generation that I feel um, made a very, very significant contribution. Um, John Paul Borelli. Mm. Oh, wow. Mm, yeah. Because the, the person that actually turned John Paul Borelli mm -hmm. on with me, 
in your place was Booker T. Williams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, could you elaborate on the music of these two individuals? Well, John Paul more so than Booker T. Okay. But um, John Paul came to New York 17 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, he was big, baby face. I knew he was a baby, but mm -hmm. but he was not like dependent or or seemingly vulnerable you know he, mm -hmm. he wasn't tough he, you know but he came in and stayed with me maybe six months or more maybe a year you know and he started but the thing that was always serious about john paul borelli was he had the instrument under control at 17 mm -hmm. and it was just a matter of him working and improving on that and he was listening to all different kinds of music because all kinds of crazy people come into that studio all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And he's there every day. Sometimes I wouldn't be there and he'd be absorbing all these different kinds of musicians. I mean, uh, 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 Dollar Brand would come to and rehearse mm -hmm. and, and Cecil, all kinds of different people would bring their bands to mm -hmm. there. And, and he just absorbed all this, you know. And then one day he got ready and he said, I got me an apartment uptown on uh, somewhere, mm -hmm. not too far from where I'm living now, in fact, at 150. He found a place up there and didn't look back. When you look at the way he plays compared to a lot of other guitarists, mm -hmm. how do you feel his contribution to this, the evolution of the guitarists? Because that gets back to your thing about people were listening to rock and they're listening to. Mm -hmm. You weren't really, you said you weren't really into that. But, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> well, well, they came out of that with like, nah, nah, nah. Elvin, you, let's you, go. You were into that without <laughs> wanting to be into that because oh, yeah, it was yeah. surrounding you every day. And John so, Paul was like that. And, and John Paul definitely knew how to play funk, you know. Right. I, I mean, that was, you know, you come from Chicago, you know how to play the blues in many different forms. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's, it's part of your culture there, see. Now, you didn't see that as much in New York. When I came to New York, you almost had to go to find the blues. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still kind of weird if you want to hear some real blues like you hear in the South and in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. It's hard to find that in New York. Well, all I know is this. Um, mm. Based on, based on um, my experiences in life, it's really an honor for me to have you two of them in my house. Thank you for tuning in. In months ahead, you will have the opportunity to hear from many more Lost Generation artists and supporters. The audio only version is available wherever you get your podcast. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to hear upcoming episodes.